Welcome everybody to the Cantor Bursting Theorem. Now let's give it a go. So what we want to say is that we have A1, which is equivalent to all of B, and B1, which is equivalent to all of A, and so we want to prove that A is equivalent to B. And what does equivalent mean? It means that we have the same number of elements in here versus the same number of elements in here. Now that's you would think that would be easy to prove if you have a finite amount of elements. So if this has three rocks and this has three tires, well, you just have to count them and show that if <laughs> if three rocks are in this subset and all of B has three tires, and B1 has three tires, and all of A has three rocks, well then obviously A has to be equivalent to B, because they both have three of something. But how does it happen with infinite sets, infinite countable sets? Well, we're going to show you. Let's do it. So A1 is equivalent to B, as we just said, which means F of A1 equals B. In other words, if you converted rocks to tires, you would get three tires, which is what's in here. That's what we're saying here. A1 is a subset of A, as we just said. In other words, in real life, Basically, A1 would be A, or it would be that everything else is empty, if that makes any sense. So a bucket holding a bucket of three rocks would still have three rocks. <laughs> okay, so A1 is equivalent to B. B1 is a subset of B. Same deal. B1 is equivalent to A, and we need to prove that A is equivalent to B. So let's give it a go. Now, as I just told you before, F of A1 goes to B, and that's because it's a subset. Pretty easy stuff. So all we have to do now is we can show also some other stuff. Are you ready? Now let's write out the next part. We're going to say, all right, I just wrote this again for you guys, and someone's racing down the street. Beautiful. So then, they've already told us it's equivalent, which means that this function is one-to-one. -one. That means, as we said, we can, well, I already explained what that means, roughly. So therefore, this implies that a1 equals f of minus 1b. So I've just done f of, I've reversed f here and reversed f there. So I've got f of minus 1b is a1. Right. Now, what we can do is just change that and call it G. It's just, just making it easier. All right, what I've done here is I've said GB equals A1. So A1 is G of B. So G of B is A1. That's all. I've just swapped it around to make it easy to look at. Now, why am I doing this? You may ask. Well, you're about to see a pattern. If you remember before, I said B1 is equivalent to A. Well, that just means that they're related by, via a function. As I said, one could be rocks, one has tires. We switch tires to rocks and we get the same elements in the other set. And there it is. That implies that F of A equals B1. I just showed you before they're equivalent, so that means you apply a function to it and you'll get the other one there, right? You switch rocks to tires or tires to rocks and you get tires or rocks on the other side. And it's basically the same set. Set of three tires, change tires to rocks, I get the set of three rocks. All right, you ready? Now, let's take G of this. In other words, if that was rocks, we F made it tires. Or if this was tires, F made it rocks. And now when we apply G, it's going to change it from rocks back to tires. Right? Now, in mathematics, that's clearly not what's going on, but I'm trying to give you some sort of picture. So let's do it, right? You ready? G of F of A. Well, it's the same as saying G of B1. Okay. Now, G of B1 means we flipped it back to the other set. Okay, we've gone from, you can see it here. You can see that we've got G of B goes back to A1. Well, that just means if G of B goes to A1, well, then G of B1 is going to go to A2. You can keep going forever, just making smaller and smaller subsets if you want. Um, actually, what's really going on is that the subset's not changing at all. We're still keeping the three rocks and the three tires. We're just getting buckets within buckets within buckets, but they're still containing those three elements. Obviously, in real life, you'd have a limit on how small the bucket could be, but in mathematics, you are independent of that because we're working of independent of anything. It's all abstract. It's quite awesome. The reason that's awesome is because then you can apply it to anything, and you'll see why this is so important uh, in the future. Well, if anyone does any physics or biology or anything, you'll see that this type of stuff underpins the mathematics that you do at university because you need these rules underneath uh, to actually know how to do anything later on um, with calculus, etc. But you don't need to physically know this. Mathematicians need to know this because they then come up with or discover new rules in the future and then we can have new types of mathematics for new solutions to existing problems. Now... What that means is that means if I get G of F of A, it turns into A2. Now, I could keep doing it for you and bore you, but instead of doing that, I'm going to sh basically, you can, you can conclude from this, but you would have to actually do it multiple times um, and then do something uh, called, uh, ooh, if I can remember correctly from high school maths, uh, induction, process of induction. That's the one. And that will, this will show you that G of F of A to whatever K it is, is going to equal a k plus 2. And this will always be the subset of the one before it, which will be the subset of the one before it. And if that's the case, you're going to get this. You're going to get a is the superset 
of A1, because A1's a subset of A, and then A2 is a subset of A1, and then it just keeps going all the way down, A, K, and it just keeps going and going and going forever. So what you can actually do is if this is all A1, then this ring would be A1 minus A2. But then A2 minus A3 would be this ring. And so you can represent A, the whole thing, as the sum of these infinite rings, which is pretty awesome. And then right at the end, you add this section here, the infinitely smallest one, which will be the intersection of the whole lot, which will be whatever this infinite little point will be. And so let me write that out for you. And there it is. I've done it for you. So look, you can see A minus A1, which is... A minus A1, which will be the A ring, which I haven't drawn, but whatever. And then in union, so we add it to A1 minus A2. A1 minus A2 will give you this ring. So it's all of the rings all the way down. And then we've got the universal intersection from K equals 1 to infinity of A to K. And what is that? Well, that, as we said, is this intersection of all of these. So the subset of the subset. So basically, this goes to infinity. So what we're saying is that if we go to infinity, wherever there's an intersection... So the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest dot where they all intersect right at infinity, we're going to add that right onto the end and we'll end up getting this whole set okay, of A. It's like the little point right in the infinitesimally small middle. Okay. All right, the next step is to get every odd ring, so this ring, this ring, the next ring, all the odd ones, and I'm going to group them all together under a set called M. So A is M plus or in union with the odd six, so the even ones. So, well, I started with even and then odd, but it doesn't matter, whatever. So, and then the odd ones will be A1, A3, A5, and I'll get those rings as well. So this M would be this one, A, A2, A4, A6, and then N, which I'm going to put here, is going to be A1, A3, A5, A7. Okay, but remember, we've got to add that little final dot, this thing here, and I'm going to call that D just to make it easy for us. So let's just confirm. We've got all of the even rings, all of the odd rings, and the final infinitely small dot. That's A. Well, guess what? A1 is almost the same. It's M in union with N1, which would just be, uh, well, it doesn't have, what have I done here? Um, well, I've told you, I've told you that M was the even one, so I'll call it M1. It doesn't really matter. Okay, so this has M1 with N. And so, M1 is because uh, we started with the next even one. So because we're starting with A1, A1 is only these rings, not the outer ring. So we can't start with A and A2. We have to start with A2, A4, A6. That's all it is. So it's just that we're not starting. These are the even rings. These are also even rings, but we're not counting A in this one because A is outside of the set of A1. All right. N is the same deal as all the odd ones in union with D. Now, that's quite funny, isn't it? Because look what we can do. There's now a one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, that's the same, and that's the same. And there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these because there's an infinite amount of even rings, and here there's an infinite amount of even rings. So we can just say the first ring here maps to the second one here. The second one here maps to the third one here. The third one here maps to the fourth one here, and they just keep mapping for infinity. Okay? What I mean is that with A, we got this one and then A2. Well, with A1, we've got A2, then A4. So it's like two rings in pairs, and one maps to the next one, next one maps to the next one, and that's a one-to-one -one correspondence for infinity. Well, that just shows you right there that A is actually equivalent to A1. But we said at the beginning, if you remember, we said at the beginning that A1 was equivalent to B. So therefore, A also has to be equivalent to B. Done. There's our proof, guys. So you can see how much goes into a proof which is so important because without that, we would never know that for an infinite amount of sets or a set with infinite elements, it's still, this rule still applies. And it's very crazy, right? Because it's mind-blowing, this stuff.